Hello and welcome to the fourth installment of our webinar series, Art and Architecture with Kurt DiCamillo. My name is Ginevra Morse. I am the Director of Education and Online Programs at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator and virtual MC for today's event. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We are the oldest and largest genealogical organization in the country, and we specialize in providing resources, research, and expertise to uncover and share the stories of families, family objects, and family homes. We are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. So today we'll look at the impact, the influence, and the legacy of the Adam family, the Scottish architects who changed the world. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the question panel at any point during the presentation. We will answer as many as we can at the end. And I do want to note that we are, of course, still broadcasting from our homes with various limitations and distractions. We apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end, and we thank you for your patience. Even if we were to lose connection uh, with you from our end, you will have access to a full recording on our website as well as our YouTube channel. Our presenter today, whose heart beats to a neoclassical rhythm, is Kurt D. Camillo, an internationally recognized authority on English country houses and the decorative arts. Kurt joined American Ancestors in February of 2016 as our first curator of special collections. A longtime member of NEHGS, Kurt has led highly successful heritage tours for our organization to England and Scotland, lectured extensively in the United States and abroad, and has taught classes on British culture and art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Kurt was previously executive director of the National Trust for Scotland Foundation, USA. As curator of special collections here at American Ancestors, Kurt provides strategic direction and expert guidance for organizing and exhibiting our extensive collection of family history related artifacts. Please join me in welcoming Kurt DiCamillo. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I want to say, first of all, that it's pouring rain here in Boston as I sit here and look out my window. But that does not do anything to dampen the enthusiasm of our co-supporters in this lecture. And I want to thank the four most important ones. The Royal Oak Foundation, which is the English National Trust in America, the National Trust for Scotland Foundation, the Addingham Summer School, and the British American Business Council of New England. So let's talk about these people. William Adams Sr., who you see here in the screen, is the father of the four brothers that became much more famous than he did, particularly his um, second son, Robert. William was probably the most important architect in Scotland in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. And he left an amazing and very important legacy, but he didn't have the success that his, his sons did, and nor did he have, I don't think, the same verve that they did. I'm gonna go through and show you one by one um, the four sons that after his death came together in a practice in London, starting with John Adam, who you've seen here. Um, he was the eldest, he was the business manager of the firm, and I should say all four of these boys um, designed houses but Robert Adam is the most important player here. He's the one who became internationally famous, and you see him here. Um, he, he's the one who's responsible for most of the houses we're gonna see today. Um, but all of the brothers contributed in one way or another. Um, you can see James, the third brother here in the next slide, who primarily worked on interiors, which shouldn't surprise anybody considering how fancy he looks. His, um, his brothers joked that it took him three hours to get dressed in the morning. The, the last brother, William Jr., we know little about. He was very quiet. He only designed one house that I'm aware of. He contributed with his brothers to the other houses. He liked hunting and he was a landscape designer and we have no image of him, but recent scholarship um, has come up with a projection that he may have looked like this, um, particularly with his love of hunting. Now, to Senior, which is say William Adams Senior, the daddy. This to me is 
the most important house that he designed, the House of Dunn and Angus in Scotland. This is, for its time in the early 18th century, a house of incredible sophistication, particularly in Scotland, which was sort of a backwater at the time. This is um, based on a lot of French precedent, and it shows you how in touch William Adams Sr. was with things going on in the continent. This house, very sadly, after um, it ceased being a house, had a number of unfortunate uses, um, including movie theater and supposedly a brothel. It was rescued in the mid 20th century and was taken over by the National Trust for Scotland who own it today. And in this next slide, you can see the Queen Mother, who was the president of the National Trust for Scotland and who of course was herself Scottish, um, here at the House of Dunn in 1989, marking the 300th anniversary of William Adams Sr.'s birth. So when we go into the house, you come into this entrance hall, staircase hall, that's nice not like something that knocks your socks off. It's typical for a house of its period, but beyond this room into the next that we can see on the right here is the reason you come here. This is the saloon, which is unlike any other room in Scotland. And it's a, an explosion of Baroque plasterwork that is very out of keeping with the rest of the house and indeed with the styles of the time. And it's this room alone brings people from all over the world. A lot of scholars consider William Sr.'s most important work to be Hopeton House, which you see here, which he did in the early 18th century. Not me, I think it's a very important house, um, but it's it's sufficient. You can see it's, it's a relatively staid design. It doesn't set the world on fire. Um, about 30 years later, Robert came and redid the other sides. So we're looking at the west facade, and in this next slide, you're gonna see the east facade which is much more sophisticated and much more drawing on European precedent. This was done for the Earl of Hopeton. It's still owned by the family today, the Marquises of Linlithgow. And to really understand what Robert Adam did, we need to go to the next slide to see the whole view of the house. This is the largest house in Scotland. Probably shouldn't surprise anybody because <laughs> it's pretty damn huge. I have that arrow there pointing down to the colonnade that links the two quadrant wings to the main block because I think that it was based on this. We know that Robert Adam loved everything Italian. This, of course, is Bernini's great colonnade at St. Peter's in Rome. And there are all kinds of reasons to support this, not the least of which is that Robert Adam's friends and colleagues called him Bob the Roman. So much was his love of everything Roman. So very important to everything that Robert Adam did, and to indeed to other people at the time, were excavations going on throughout Europe, particularly in Italy. But what I'm going to take you to before we go there is to a palace in what is today Croatia. This is Diocletian's palace, or the remains of it. This is the only surviving Roman palace in the world. And as you can see in this next slide, um, it was something else. It was spectacular. It was built in the first century AD as the retirement home for the Roman Emperor Diocletian. <laughs> He's one of the very few emperors who actually retired from the job and didn't get killed. And this was his, <laughs> his retirement home. What makes this important to us and to this story about Robert Adam is that he was the first Western European to come to this site and to measure and draw all the remains, which were substantial, in fact, still are substantial. And then he came back to England or to Britain, and he published these in 1764 in a book called The Ruins of the Palace of the Emperor Diocletian at Splatro in Dalmatia. This was enormously influential. What you see here is a copy of the book that he presented to the King George III. And this was a confluence with what was going on, as I said, at other excavations, particularly in Italy, like Pompeii, which you'll see in the next slide, or Herculaneum. Um, this brought together sort of a fever pitch of interest in the ancient world. And Adam used that with tutelage because when he was on his grand tour in Italy, when he was doing these drawings, he made the friendship of Giovanni Peronese. Peronese, of course, um, is an Italian and very famous for his etchings. And what you see here is mid 18th century etching he did of a imaginary temple. He was very famous for this kind of thing, which is a big building that was 
by the times, the technology times, almost impossible to build, but fantasy buildings that were spectacular. He took Bob, Robert Adam and showed him things that most foreigners would never see. And they became very good friends. And you'll see in this next slide, there's a, a page that um, Peronese engraved for a book that he published showing the two of them on an imaginary coin. That's Robert Adam there on the right. That's how close they became. And it was through his tutelage that Adam was able to get instruction in drawings, but also to be introduced to places, as I said, that most Western Europeans wouldn't be admitted. And you can see this is one of his first drawings. These are of fallen masonry. Um, he would use these ideas much, much throughout his career. Now, of course, Adam did not work by himself in creating what I call the age of Adam. I'm not the only one by any means who calls it that. Um, he had partners. And one of the most important partners are these guys. Um, well, actually, not these guys, um, but it might be these guys, although they are very hunky. Not those either, actually. It's actually this one, of whom those are all named after. And that, of course, is Thomas Chippendale, who was probably the most important furniture maker who ever lived. In 1754, he published the book you see before you, The Gentleman and Cabinet Maker's Director. This book has never been out of print since then, and it was hugely influential. What he, of course, was doing, which is something that the Adam brothers did as well, was to show you beautiful designs that he had that hopefully you would hire him to do, and that certainly happened. But the other thing that happened is that people would buy his book, and then they would hire someone else to make his designs, which he was also fine with because he got money from the book. Now, in this next slide, you'll see a lovely drawing by Adam for a table that was is because it was made at a house in Nostal Priory in Yorkshire now owned by the National Trust and you can see the final product in the next slide which isn't quite as happy and bright but it, it is an exact recreation of the drawing and this is the partnership that Adam and Chippendale had throughout their professional careers another important member of this team of collaborators was Josiah Wedgwood um, who you see here in one of his most famous portraits. Um, most people believe he did not have teacups for eyes. I like to think that he did. Um, so Wedgwood is particularly close to my heart because I love Jasperware, which of course is the process that he invented. It took him four years and 12,000 failed experiments before he came up with a formula for Jasper that would work, that wouldn't crack on the kiln. And what you see in the next slide is a perfect example of that. This is a medallion. It was made in 1984 to celebrate the 225th founding of the company. And you see where I have that arrow there. That's pointing to the Portland Bays, which Wedgwood considered the highest accomplishment of his life. This is the actual vase itself. This is um, first century AD Roman cameo glass. This is actually glass that was carved. So they made it in layers of color and then carved away the white to reveal the figures. Um, and you, it's actually blue. And that's why I have that arrow down there at the bottom. You can see a little bit from the photograph because it's translucent, um, a little bit of blue poking through. So what Wedgwood wanted to do was to make this in Jasperware, a version of clay rather than glass, and to produce it in mass, which he did in the late 18th century. You see a version today that's in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, this was very expensive even in its own day and also had a lot of problems getting it to, to the kiln to work properly. But this was hugely influential in creating the whole movement for the love of everything neoclassical. The British Museum who owns the original has not been, um, they've not been slackers in marketing um, the Portland Bays. I'm slightly embarrassed to say that I own every one of the things in this slide. Um, I think I gave the tie away, but I did have the tie at one point. The thing is that, of course, Wedgwood particularly has carried down into our day with his influence, and an intermediate stop in between that was um, the 19th century when there was a great revival of the Adam style. And what you see here is a fireplace that was made in 1882 um, out of Wedgwood Jasperware and white Carrera marble for a house in Lincolnshire that's been demolished called Buckminster Park. This is an unusual tour de force of Wedgwood. 
lots of Wedgwood fireplaces were made over the years. This is a custom one that has an unusual sage green background, and it is today in the collection of the Birmingham Museum of Art in Alabama, which has probably the second greatest collection of Wedgwood in the world outside the Wedgwood Museum in England. The last collaborator I'm going to talk about is this guy, Matthew Bolton, who probably to most people is most famous today for this material that he used called Blue John. That's a semi-precious stone that I have a personal passion for. What you see here before you is um, a milk pail made of Blue John in the early 19th century. It's about three inches high, so it's obviously not a real milk pail. And it's been lit from the inside um, by lighting to give it a sense of glowing because it wouldn't look this nice just sitting on your shelf. But it shows you how wonderful this mineral is. It's veins of colors, primarily blues and yellows. And we think that's where the word came from. We think that Blue John is a corruption of the French Blue Jean. Um, but it comes in other colors too. You can get it in just cream. You can get it in blue. You can get it in green. And this is something that our guy Bolton took and used and carved it into things that he put together with metals that he casted. And the thing about Blue John that I think is particularly important is that it comes from only one space in the entire world. That's in Derbyshire, England. So it's very expensive. So what you see here, this is Matthew Bolton at his best. These are two candle vases. He did the, the metal work, which is actually ormolu. That's bronze covered with gold. He had carvers make the little insertions, the egg shapes of Blue John. And you can see how expensive this stuff is now. This set sold at Christie's in 2014 for $437,000 against an estimate of two to $300,000. So um, really over the top, but I have to tell you what I think is more over the top is what you're gonna see in this next slide, which is, um, a set that was made for the king, George III, for his wife, Queen Charlotte's private sitting room at Windsor Castle. This is another candle vase, but much more grand and using, I think, probably a lot of ancient precedents as well as French designs. And then together with this, the king also commissioned a clock that went into the same chamber. And you can see in this example how much darker the blue john is. It's the pace right around the face of the clock there. And the reason I'm showing this to you is because this is interesting because it does not involve Robert Adam. It has one of his competitors, another architect called William Chambers, who designed this. And it shows you, I think, sort of a tour de force of neoclassical design that is just beyond yummy. You can sort of tell I like this stuff. So there are practical things that they did together, these teams. And you'll see in this slide, buttons, Wedgwood buttons. This is a perfect collaboration between Wedgwood who made the Jasper medallions that were then set into these steel cut buttons that were made by Matthew Bolton. And what's interesting is in an attempt to create some diamonds or even rhinestones, what Matthew Bolton has done instead is he has polished and cut steel so that it catches the light and looks like a glittery stone around it. So you could actually have something that looked very rich even if you couldn't afford the real thing. Bolton became rich himself from all of his wares and very unusually for the time moved up in society and he built this house, Soho House in Birmingham, which is still there today. It's a museum owned by the city of Birmingham and has a lot of his beautiful work in it, including this next piece that you're going to see, which is a wonderful um, tea vase that he made for his own use. Now this is unusual because it's made of silver. Very often um, you see ormolu is the most, the, the, the material that Bolton wanted to use in almost every way he could. And this silver, which was used to store tea and um, was just a tour de force of the silversmith's art. And, and everything that Bolton did, of course, was also to show you what he could do. So it'd be the next advertisement for you like this, I can get you something even grander. Now, a number of these people, including Bolton and Josiah Wedgwood, and Erasmus Darwin, who of course was Charles Darwin's grandfather, um, and James Watt, who invented or perfected the steam engine, were members of a society called the Lunar Society. This was part of what's now called the Midlands Enlightenment. This was a group of progressive men who formed this club and they came together on full moons to meet each other's houses, to have dinner parties and talk about politics and, and science. And the reason they met on full moons is because there were no street lights then. 
Full Moons gave you the best opportunity to find your way home and also give you a better chance of not being robbed along the way. And one of the most important focuses that this group did, that they worked toward, was the abolition of slavery. And you see Wedgwood here making one of his most famous pieces, which is an anti-slavery medallion. Around the, the side there, it says, am I not a man and a brother? This is something that Wedgwood donated, so he didn't even put the profits to this. All the sales of these medallions were given over to try to abolish the slave trade. And this group, the Lunar Society of Industrialists and Intellectuals and Philosophers came together and were very effective at helping to lobby the British Parliament to eventually, in the early 19th century, abolish the slave trade. So a perfect example of how all these various pieces come together in a successful whole is this cabinet that the Duchess of Manchester commissioned. She had these, these plaques and she wanted them set into a cabinet. So Robert Adam designed the cabinet. Ensign Mayhew, contemporary furniture makers, created it. And then Matthew Bolton made the metal parts. So the capitals and the columns. But the columns themselves and their capitals were derived directly from the book that Robert Adam wrote on the ruins of the palace of Diocletian that I mentioned earlier. All of these things come together in the perfect synthesis that I mentioned to you earlier called the age of Adam. And you see to me, this is a perfect illustration of that look. This is actually a page from a book published by Robert and James Adam called Works in Architecture. And this, these are hand colored engravings. They were once again trying to show you what you could have in your house if you hired them. They also, as I said, made, made money from the book. But this is the perfect synthesis of what I consider to be the Adam style, which is light colors, bright colors, delicate, delicate little neoclassical things, all of which, of course, were taken from ancient Roman precedent. One of the most surprising, I think, Adam houses is in Scotland. This is Killane Castle. Yes, it's actually pronounced Killane um, in Ayrshire, now owned by the National Trust for Scotland. And this is unusual because this is one of his very rare castle style houses. This is built on a cliff overlooking the Atlantic and it has all the looks of a great medieval castle. But of course, nobody, not even in the 18th century, wanted to have the interior of the castle, which was cold and drafty and stony. So you have, I think, that sort of this interesting juxtaposition of a castle on the outside and then warm modern, because these are 18th century rooms, very Georgian tears in the inside and the old eating room, which is now set up by the trust as a sitting room, you see here, I think perfectly gives you that feeling of what it was like to have a warm, cozy house, but still get to live in a castle. You can see that I have a photograph here of the door handle in this room, because one of the things that Adam did that he was the first architect to do this, when you hired him, he gave you everything, which also made him a pain in the ass to work with, but he would design the door handles, the ceilings, the curtains, the furniture, the rugs, the colors. He would tell you what colors are going to be in the room. You could see how someone coming in and telling you what your house was going to look like could be a problem because you have two big egos butting heads with each other. But his taste was impeccable. And I think a lot of people who go to Colleen today consider that his drawing room is one of the most impressive spaces here. This is a cylindrical room, a complete circle that looks out over the Atlantic Ocean. And you'll get a better view from the other side of the room, which I think is actually even more impressive in this next shot, because we can see looking up to the ceiling and how the ceiling and the rug mirror each other, which is something else that Adam liked, either having the same shape or the same colors. And I particularly want you to look at that plaster work in the ceiling, which in the next slide you can see the richness of the colors, but more particularly how heavy the plasterwork is, how thick it is, what high relief it is. This is something that Adam pretty much invented in the modern world. And of course, these kinds of ceilings were relatively easy to make because they were all made from molds. So you could create the molds and just made copies and then literally adhered them to the ceiling. And then they were oftentimes hand painted. Sometimes they were left white. Now, the most famous room at Colleen is the Oval Staircase. And in this next shot, you'll get a feeling as to why people come and go ooh and ah. This is something that Adam derived and it shows you part of his genius, um, which is to take an existing older house and to join it with the new house he was putting together. And that's what this staircase did. You can also see 
this mug that the National Trust for Scotland sold that has elements of things in the oval staircase. So the capitals, the columns, and the balusters, which are part of the balustrade, are incorporated into this mug, which actually is sitting beside me right this minute, and which I'm going to take a sip of water from. I love that mug. Now, to give you the full sense of this space, it's important to look at it from the ground up because it's three stories. And the very top one you see there where the arrow is, that's a, a whole floor that's called the Eisenhower apartment. And today the National Trust for Scotland runs this as an upscale hotel with a French chef and all kinds of luxury service. And the reason it's called that is because after World War II, the nation of Scotland wanted to do something to thank Dwight Eisenhower, who of course was Supreme Allied Commander during the war. And they decided to give him the top floor of Clane Castle for his lifetime as a thank you gift. And he came here many times as a general and as president of the United States. And this is a lovely photograph of him with the royal family walking on the lawn at Killeen. He oftentimes was supposedly heard to say in the White House when he's having a very bad day, get me out of here, let's go to Killeen. Not surprisingly, good golf around here, which was another thing that, of course, that Eisenhower was passionate about. Now, the thing about our friend Mr. Adam is that he was a crafty, which is to say, unethical, backstabbing businessman. One of the things that he was infamous for was going to rich people, and this example you see here before you, Harvard House is a, a good example, rich people building big houses with other architects and then bad-mouthing those architects to the, the rich people who are building houses, eventually convincing them to hire him instead. And what that means is there are very few houses built from the ground up by Adam. Almost always he came in after house was semi-complete or completed and convinced the owner to hire him. And what you see at Harwood, which is designed by one of his competitors called John Carr or Carr of York, what Adam did here, which is very common for him, he did the interiors over in an existing house. Redoing interiors had been done by another architect. The entrance hall, which you see here, I think is a perfect example of, of the yumminess that he could put together. Just luscious, very subdued colors. All the furniture designed by Adam, as I said, and you see in this next slide where I have that yellow arrow, one of the hall chairs that he designed. Hall chairs, of course, are very common in the great English houses and they tend to be usually unpainted wood. This is the most luscious hall chair I have ever seen in my life. I mean, good God almighty, I would, I. I want to have my ashes sort of scattered on that chair. It's too yummy for words. Just as yummy is the old library, which you'll see in this next slide, which encapsulates Adam's idea of colors. And you see that the painting he had done there, which is, everything was based on ancient Rome or Greece, most particularly Rome. This to me is a perfect encapsulation of this. This library became too small, which is why it's now called the old library. So in the 19th century, the family hired another architect to take what was Robert Adams' saloon that you see before you here, and they called that the new library. And what Barry did was to put in these um, wonderful mahogany bookcases and pretty much leave the rest of the room the same. And I should mention as well, uh, actually, that Harwood House is still owned by the family that built it, the Lassells family. Um, their title is Earl of Harwood. And the house, like all the houses I'm going to show you today, um, is open to the public. So the next room, the yellow drawing room, is an explosion of grandeur and just bright, beautiful yumminess. This shows you, I think, what Adam's capable of. He would listen to his clients now and then, but he is one of those, those people who believed he knew more than anybody else. He also had this unfortunate habit of not paying his workers a draftsman very well, or sometimes not at all. We won't go down that road. Um, so let's go to the most important reason people come to Harvard, which is its collection of Chippendale. It has the finest collection of Chippendale in the world. And what you see before you is the state bed that Robert Adam designed and Thomas Chippendale made. Chippendale made more furniture for this house than any other house. And the key thing is he made the furniture for the house, as opposed to you going down to London to the Chippendale showroom and buying existing pieces or picking something out of a catalog. He came up and designed the furniture for specific spaces. And I believe it took him eight years, he and his shop, to make the furniture for this house. To me, the most spectacular room in Harwood is the gallery, which was meant to be 
a jaw dropping room that you would just sort of gasp when you walked into. It's meant to show off the best of the collection, which you see hanging in the walls. The thing is, this to me is sort of like a religious experience coming into this room. At that door at the far end on the left there is how you come into it. And when I was taking a tour here a few years ago, I stopped everybody before we came into this room and I said, okay, what you're gonna see is gonna knock your socks off. And this to me, very personal, my opinion only, this is more impressive than the Hall of Mirror, Mirrors at Versailles. And I truly believe that. There was one person in the group who was from France who had a serious problem with me saying that, but I stand by it. God, this room is impressive. You'll see in the next slide, um, the gallery has the, the reflection of the ceiling into one of the pier glasses that Adam designed against the walls. He made the helmets for the curtains. And of course, I think the piece de resistance of this room is in fact the ceiling. And this is um, a photograph showing it to you as it was with its original colors. Um, these have not been retouched and it just is astonishing what happens. And to show you how much the owners have respected the past, in the 1990s, they hired a designer called Alec Cobb who came in and redecorated this room and he hand painted these blinds for the gallery, very much in respect and emulation for the design that Adam had created for it. And while we are in this part of the world, which is to say Yorkshire, we're gonna go next to Newby Hall, which has a very, I shouldn't say very, has a relatively unimpressive facade. This is a perfect example of Adam again. This is supposedly a house that was designed by Christopher Wren Adam was given the job to do some of the interiors over, not all of them, some of them. He did a spectacular job. You walk into this entrance hall, which you'll see in this next slide. Not a huge space, um, beautiful plaster work designed by Adam, all in a martial sense. This is a group that I took there years ago having tea just before we were given a tour of the house. Um, it's, it's strange because it's hard to make neoclassicism warm and cozy. It's usually very chilly. This room does that. This room to me is very intimate. And you can go from here into this wonderful corridor called the Red Passage that Adam put these incredible colors in, this barrel vaulted ceiling and these medallions and plaster along the walls with paintings with plaster frames around them. And that leads into a lovely yellow dining room that is still used today as a dining room. This is a house that's also owned by its original family. And um, you can see in the far left there, one of the lanterns made of alabaster, with one in each of the niches that helped to give the room, thank you, Ginevra, helped to give the room um, even more of a yellow glow. Once again, a very warm room. Something we don't generally think of when we think of Robert Adam are tapestries. But what he did for Newby, he went to, to Paris, to the Gobelin factory, and commissioned a series of tapestries specifically for this room. So these were woven for these spaces. They're based um, on designs of Boucher called the Loves of the Gods. And what's interesting about this is how all these various pieces came together. So then Adam brought in Chippendale and said, I want you to design furniture to go with these tapestries and in this room. So the furniture is covered with tapestry material and it is the only Chippendale furniture in the world that still has its original coverings on it. You can also see, once again, me loving door work. This is Robert Adams' um, wonderful Ormolu door handle that I think every one of these, he would do these differently in every room. Just, just exquisite imagination. And to give you a sense of how beautiful these tapestries are, this next slide um, has a lovely table that was designed by Adam with faux cameo reliefs in it. But the real purpose of this slide is to show you the brilliance of the colors. This is something that I think we forget today. It was astonishing, particularly in the 17th century, people just went orgasmic over tapestries. And we see them today, we go, eh, they're brown, they're mainly browns and blues because they've faded so much. Now this is, has the advantage of being 18th century, so it's much later, but it has also faded. But you get a sense in this photograph of what was possible with these tapestries and what the color they brought and the vividness and how hard they were to make, how expensive and why you showed them off. So the next room I'm gonna show you is Robert Adams Library. Once again, like most of the rooms he did at Newby, not a huge room. Um, nice proportions, incredible neoclassical plaster work, 
another one of those those lovely alabaster lamps and the niche in the background there. And this room and the next one are probably the most famous rooms at Newby because the most famous room, which leads right off of the library, is the sculpture gallery, which has a central dome room modeled in the Pantheon in Rome, amazing plaster work. And then you have sort of tribunes, off rooms coming off the sides of it, each of them filled with classical sculpture. At one time, this was one of the most important collections of classical sculpture in private hands in the world. I say at one time because a number of pieces have been sold off. Um, the Jenkins Venus was one of those. This is a um, famous piece that was originally in the Barberini collection in Rome that was sold, I think, in 2002 to um, a Qatari royal for eight million pounds. And part of the deal with the family was you have to provide for us an exact laser copy in Carrera Marble, which is what's there today, which you can really can't tell the difference, believe it or not. Um, in this next slide, there's some, uh, something I think that's really fun and practical about what Adam did. In that middle sculpture, the tallest one, where I have the red arrow, the plinth, the base that the sculpture sits on is actually a heating vent. And those louvers, those things can be open and closed to regulate the temperature. Far to the left there, you can see a first century AD Roman sculpture of arrows as, as a term. Those of you who were like me, old enough to remember 1985, might remember this being one of the stars of the exhibition that came to the National Gallery of Art in Washington. This was used for a lot of the um, illustrations to promote the exhibition. Now, everybody has a different opinion. A lot of people believe that this house, I'm gonna show you now, Kettleston Hall, in Derbyshire was Adam's greatest house. This is his drawing for the bridge that he proposed to dissolve for this house. Now you can see in the next slide, the bridge as it actually turned out was considerably different, but the important part here is to have a bridge. In many of these houses, there was no need for a bridge. There was no body of water that needed to be scanned. It was just, we want a bridge because it's much more dramatic to go over up to the house. So they would actually redirect a river or create a lake to have a bridge to go over it. And the purpose was you cross over this lovely bridge, and then you get the first view of the house. And this is the view you see, the north facade of Kettleston. This is another example of Adam coming to a house after it was pretty much built. He didn't design any of this that you see here. This was designed by a number of other architects. But he's the one who convinced the owner, Lord Scarsdale, who was a member of the Curzon family, that he was going to be much better. And of course, I have to say, even though the architects that did the house were competent, no one could have brought the verve that he did to the interiors. And he also did, as we'll see later, the south facade. So the reason you come here is because of the enormity of this house, which is now owned by the National Trust. Um, look here in 1895 at the then owner, Lord Curzon, way down there on top, addressing his tenants on his wedding day. And it's important to mention tenants because this is what the nature of a country house was. The purpose of country house was to be the center of an agricultural estate. And these people either rented from him just as paying tenants or they worked for him in his farm or they actually tended to the farm. And th this is very much a part, which still exists in some places today in Britain of the feudal residue we have when you had an enlightened Lord who um, took care of his tenants. The reason most scholars come to Kettleson today is to go to see the Marble Hall, which is one of the most spectacular rooms in Europe, in my opinion. No less than the New York Times, as you see here, it said one of the most glorious rooms ever built. Um, this is modeled on a Roman, it, it, it's, it's got so much going on, I can't even know where to begin. Around here, Jennifer, you can move your um, up here with those scenes are over the door, all along, uh, Thank you very much. Those are scenes from the life of Homer. The ceiling, the plaster work, the columns, those are columns um, of Derbyshire mined on the family's estates in Staffordshire. They're 25 feet tall. They were carved in situ in this room. Um, everything around you is meant to feel like you're walking into a Roman temple. And when we get a side view of it, as you'll see in this next slide, I think it's no less impressive. Um, once again, not a warm and friendly room, not what neoclassicism usually is, but my 
got it knocks your socks off. And you can see where I have this arrow here that's pointing to one of the fireplaces. There are two fireplaces in this room, which I can promise you did not do anything to warm the room. Once again, Adam, at his best in this fireplace, plaster work over the fireplace itself, a roundel um, painted into a plaster frame. And then to keep things even more practical, but yet beautiful, you'll see in the next slide, the doors that he designed. There are four of these doors that lead off of the hall. You can see where I have the arrow there, it points to this door that I'm showing you. They were painted with panels that look like they came out of Pompeii. And the symbolism of ancient Rome didn't end there. He was inspired by so much of what he saw and he designed 12 benches that were done in the 1780s that you see one of the benches here coming down from that yellow arrow. They were modeled on the tomb of Agrippa in Rome, which sadly doesn't exist anymore, but which he saw. And you can see he used this to great effect to creating these benches, still with their original velvet fabric, which is also astonishing. This next slide, I really don't have anything to say about it, except I just can't stop showing you pictures of this space. I really want to show you this one because of the lovely veining in the alabaster. This, of course, is a copy of the famous Apollo Belvedere. These are 18th century painted plaster cast. It's interesting because um, when Lord Scarsdale commissioned this, he didn't really care if he had real Roman statues in there. He wanted the effect and it works perfectly. It is a tour de force. Almost as impressive is the room that leads off of it, which is the saloon, which has this incredible dome, 63 feet high, modeled in the Pantheon in Rome, set in once again with lovely paintings around there. Where I have those two yellow arrows, those are some wonderful sconces. And I believe there are eight of them in the room. And here's a close-up of one of them. That's plaster work in the middle there. And those are playing cupids taken from the works of Poussin and Raphael, showing you that Adam didn't use just ancient things. He also would use Renaissance inspiration in his designs. The drawing room is probably my least favorite room in this house. It's just got a little too much blue for my taste. But the reason I'm showing it to you, besides the fact that it is very glittery, is because of the four sofas that Adam designed for this room. You can see that arrow there is pointing to one of them. This, um, these are unique. These were designed by Adam, made by Linnell, great um, furniture maker. The unusual for Adam in that they have Baroque slash Rococo influences and they're all modeled on a nautical theme. I don't think there's anything like this anywhere in the world. This is a one-off that he made. Keeping in with this same blue theme, when you go in to the state bedroom, you see the state bed. Once again, I just think a little too much blue going on here. Um, but this bed in this room, the wall coverings were just recently restored. And you can't see it very well in this photograph, but where I had that top red arrow there is to show you the glitter of the gold thread that, were, that made this. And that second arrow points to interlock seas for Curzon, the family who owned the house. Um, the whole idea was to walk in here and be gobsmacked by glitter. And you're topped with these um, black ostrich feathers Ostrich feathers, of course, being a symbol of royalty. And that's who these beds were built for. No one in the family would ever have slept in here. These were built, mainly made for visiting royalty. And as far as I know, no royalty ever actually slept in this bed. By the time this was done, that kind of formal fashion was falling out of fashion. The dining room is possibly the most subdued of Adam's rooms at Kettleston. Isn't to say it, it's, it's anything less than spectacular, but what I'm showing you particularly here is how he used the apse in the dining room, modeling it on the Temple of Venus in Roma, in Rome, probably designed by the Emperor Hadrian. This is something that, that Adam loved doing, which is taking things, channeling them, tweaking them, sometimes making them better, sometimes making them all right. But there's a piece in the apse I particularly want to talk about. And you'll see in this next slide, um, that piece, which is this wonderful wine cooler. Wine coolers generally, were made of wood and lined with metal. This is unusual in that it's made from an enormous hunk of Sicilian jasper. And that to me is really cool because it's a riot of color and we can see how much the Italians loved 
Sicilian Jasper when we go to St. Peter's in Rome and look at this photograph of the tomb of Pope Alexander VII. All that red around you there is Sicilian Jasper. I also want to stop before I go any further and talk about the cacophony of colors going on here. It's not just, you would never see a neoclassical architect do this. Too many colors. Um, this is so Italian and I think it's just fantastic. But what I'm drawing your attention to is that statue there on the far right. That is a statue of truth. And if you see in this next slide, the close up of her, she has her foot on the globe, which is fine. It's trying to show the Catholic Church sovereignty over the world. But more importantly, her foot is actually on Britain because over a hundred years after the Reformation and England becoming a Protestant country, the Catholic Church was still pissed off that they lost it. So it's being covered up by the, the foot of truth who's telling you the real truth, the real way is the Catholic Church. I mentioned that Adam designed an exterior here at Kettleston Hall, the opposite of what we came in on the entrance facade. This is the south facade, which looks out over the garden. This is another reason people come to this house because this is unique, certainly in British, if not European architecture. And it's unique because it's the first example, as you'll see in this next slide, in a modern sense of a building based on the Arch of Constantine in Rome, the first century Arch of Constantine, which is right outside the Colosseum. You can see the direct references here. I think on all honesty that Adam has improved on the Arch of Constantine. This is the likeness of his hand that I think is so spectacular. He also advised his clients to furnish their house in every way befitting the design of the house. And we actually have a piece in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston of silver that was commissioned for Kettleston Hall. This argyle was not only made in London, made by a female silversmith, Louisa Courtauld. And I think for my taste, it is the single most beautiful piece of silver I have ever seen. Um, it's so elegant, it just defies description. We don't know generally what argyles are today because we don't use them anymore. This had um, a cylinder, a hollow cylinder in the middle that you would fill hot water with. And then you would pour gravy around it and the cylinder would keep the gravy warm to pour from that lovely snake handle. So we're now gonna go down into the south of England to Devon in the southwest. This is Saltram House. Once again, a house that Adam did nothing on the exterior for. It's owned by the National Trust now. It's most famous, I think, to most of us because it was Norland Park in the 1995 movie of Sense and Sensibility with Emma Thompson. And it's important because unusually for a movie, which oftentimes you use one house for an exterior shot and use other houses for interiors, all of the interiors of this house, which is where these girls grew up, were filmed inside Saltram. So the library, which you'll see in this next shot, was not designed by Adam. It was, a, and this is something I think that's a testament to him as well. This was an existing library that he respected the integrity of the design and decided not to change it, but to change the rooms around it. This to me is very much the personification of an English library, um, very much what you would see in a club in London, some, a place you just want to go and sink down into. The, the reason that he did this was, I think, to probably make his rooms look more spectacular. And in this next shot in the dining room, you'll see an unusual essay of his, which is really just one color, one basic color, which is green, clearly. And if you look at the plasterwork in the ceiling and then look down to the carpet, once again, you see the same thing, the designs each reflecting the other. And the idea behind the green in a dining room was that it would make you calm and have a lovely space to eat because oftentimes um, fights would erupt over politics during 18th century dinners. So the idea was that green would calm people down. The reason you come to this house for its interiors, most spectacularly, is the saloon. And you, you're seeing a window in the saloon here. This is important because once again, we have, this window is an exact copy of one at the Emperor Diocletian's that Adam used from his book. He also designed those tables you see there, those wonderful pier tables, but the room itself is one of the most spectacular spaces that I think Adam ever created. Very different from what we see 
at Kettleson Hall. This has more warmth to it, but it is unbelievably grand. It has this incredible Axminster carpet that's original to the room that still has intense colors to it. This was, in this room was the first place in England that a waltz was danced. Interestingly enough, this house came to the National Trust in the 1950s from the original family and it had never had electricity installed in it. So these chandeliers, of which there are three, you can see two of them here, um, were actually um, very essential <laughs> to keeping light in the house. Now we're going to go to London, although technically it's London, people like to still call it Middlesex, which is a county that doesn't exist anymore, it's pretty much subsumed by London. You're looking at Austerley Park, another house owned by the National Trust. This was um, a house that was built by a rich moneylender during Elizabethan times, and you can see it's clearly an Elizabethan house with those, those red brick towers. What Adam was asked to do was to take his little touch. And unusually, in addition to the interiors, which he did over, he was allowed to put on this portico. So that clearly is a courtyard going in through there. This is unusual, putting very disparate architectural styles together and making them work. And I think this classical portico on this Tudor house works very well indeed. And what he had here is something that every architect loves, which is a rich client. The child family owned this by the 18th century and they were, they were bankers. And they gave him an enormous amount of money to work with. And he created for them a suite of amazing rooms, starting with the entrance hall, which is very chilly indeed. Um, this was supposedly modeled on the interior of a Roman mausoleum, not at all a warm and welcoming space. The next one I'm gonna show you, the next picture is I think considerably warmer. This is in the drawing room and I'm showing it to you because it's a perfect example of how Adam paid attention to all details. So this door surround that he designed, this is painted wood. Um, these two colors that he uses here, this lime green and this pink, very typical Adam colors that almost became a trademark of his. And you also see where I have those two red arrows, the griffin design that he used. These are actually gilded griffins. Griffins were something that came from antiquity, but Adam almost made them a trademark in his design. And you can see here a perfect example of where he derived his ideas from. This is a marble panel from the first century AD that's in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And this is the tail particularly with that curling, wonderful, luscious foliage coming out of it. Very, very much what Adam used over and over again in various forms. If we go into the dining room, you can see these same colors again, the, the, these, these pinks and these bluey greens, the plasterwork that he has here in these panels, and this whole dining room is filled with these panels. Um, neoclassical with a little touch of Rococo thrown in. To me, one of the most amazing things that he created here are lamps, believe it or not. This is at a time when most lighting was provided by candles, and he designed these tour de force three gas lamps that you see hanging here in the staircase hall that are, I think, unequaled anywhere in architecture. Um, they're in a pulley system, so they can be brought down to be refilled. Rams heads, acanthus leaves, all incorporated into the ormolu. Just, oof, yeah, yeah, you could put my ashes in those too. I, I wouldn't say no to that. So I wanna talk next about the color green and why it's important in general, but particularly in this house. Green, as you see here, which is why I have um, Botticelli's Birth of Venus, Green was one of the colors of Venus associated with her, which is why the, the sea is mainly green behind her there. And because Venus was the goddess of love, green was considered the color of fertility. And that's why emeralds are considered to be good luck if you want to get pregnant, and also why emeralds are considered sacred to Venus. So what color would you have your state bed done in? And that obviously would be green, which not only was supposed to be giving you a healthy air, but also green was a very expensive color to make in fabric in the 18th century. So you're also showing off to your guests that you could afford this very expensive color. This is Robert Adams drawing for the state bed at Austerley, which still exists. It's faded quite a bit over the years, but you can see in this next slide, it's still there. It's still over the top. It was modeled on an ancient temple, in this case, a temple of creation. And to reinforce the symbolism of Venus, if you go to the headboard, which 
very nicely. Ginevra is scrolling around for you there. You'll see in the next slide here more symbolism that was all focused on fertility. So you have a profile right there of Venus. And then above that, you have these puti playing in the water with dolphins. Dolphins also a symbol of Venus, a symbol of the sea, a symbol of richness and fecundity. Whew, that was a lot to get out. Now, we're going to go to the tapestry room, which I think has a spectacular plaster ceiling. And here we have Gobelin tapestries again, commissioned by Adam, very similar to what we saw at Newby Hall, but instead of that, that buff background, they have a rich sort of lustrous red background. But the real thing I want to show you here is where that arrow is pointing, because this is another collaboration of many of the people that I've been speaking about. So we have Matthew Bolton, who made this wonderful candle vase, and it sits on top of a stand designed by Adam and painted by people in his workshop in a room where he designed the tapestries and all the colors. And a house spectacular interior is possibly the most important is the Etruscan room, because at the time, nothing else like this existed in modern Europe. This was mistakenly thought to be in the 18th century Etruscan colors. They thought they were di digging up Etruscan tombs when in fact they were digging up Roman tombs, but never mind. This idea of this terracotta color with black became the rage because of this room that Adam designed. And this is something of international importance. People come from all over the world to see this room. Once again, Adam didn't just stop here. This is all hand painted on the walls. He also designed the furniture. And you can see here a detail of one of the chairs. This has never been touched. So this is the original colors. He had this amazing ability to take a cohesiveness and bring it together. And you can see why everybody wanted to have Robert Adam work in their house. He became enormously popular, especially in the 1770s and 1780s. So staying in London, we're going to go to Zion House, which is really almost around the corner from Osterley Park. This is still owned by the um, original family, the Dukes of Northumberland. It's a very unimpressive looking house from the outside. It was originally built in the 15th century as a monastery, which explains part of its exterior. It was modified and turned into a house later. Robert Adam was brought in in the 1760s to recreate a number of interiors. But he also was created, also commissioned to create a grand new entrance to the house, which you see here, the Lion Gate, which very sadly isn't used anymore. This has the, the family whose last name is Percy, their emblem, the lion with his tail standing straight out, which you see everywhere in all the various houses that have been owned by the Percy family, and very proudly announces to anybody going by that this is a house owned by a very important duke, which of course, as I said, indeed it still is today. When you walk into the entrance hall at Zion, this is possibly the most accurate Roman interior that Robert Adam ever created. It is something that I believe that any ancient Roman being transported to our time today would walk into and feel completely at home in. You can see in this next slide, another statue of the Apollo Belvedere, a very, very popular piece of art that Brits love to have. This is um, a group that I brought here a couple of years ago. We had a wonderful time where the um, Duke of Northumberland's sister took us around together with the lovely Ollie Garish. And you go from here to this entrance hall into the ante room, which is possibly the richest room that Adam ever created. It's a small room, doesn't really have a purpose except to show off. What it has that I particularly like are these columns. We see what that red arrow is. These were dredged from the Tiber in Rome and are probably first century. And they were incorporated by Adam with these standing gilded figures that just creates a real tour de force of jaw dropping wowness. And of course, like so many of these spaces, you're meant to see these rooms through other rooms, so an enfilade of view. And in this next slide, you'll actually see standing inside the anteroom looking toward the Great Hall, you see the statue of the Dying Gaul, and then beyond, beyond that, the Apollo Belvedere. The Dying Gaul, by the way, is bronze, and it's a modern. 18th century copy of an ancient statue. And the then Duke, the first Duke of Northumberland who commissioned it, wanted a particular greenish black patina. And in order to achieve that, he had it submerged in salt water for seven years to give it just the right look. This continues this classicism into the dining room. 
And here, unlike at Kettleson, these are actual marble statues. And there is symbolism as to what this, the purpose of this room is. And this is something you'll see that's carried forward in a lot of English dining rooms. And that is, this is a place to, to have food and to be merry with alcohol. And that's why we have a statue of Bacchus here. Bacchus, of course, the Roman god of wine. You can see his hair is covered with grapes. Um, and this is something, even if you didn't have Bacchus in your dining room, if you had grapes, you were indicating to your guest that this was a room to be eating and drinking in. And from here, we go into the longest room in the house, the long gallery, which is um, a residue from the time when this was a medieval house. These galleries were built very much, I shouldn't say medieval, I should actually say Tudor house, um, to exercise in, to walk back and forth when it was bad weather outside. And what Adam did, and this has faded a lot over the years, a lot of candle wax was going on to those ceilings, um, is to create a neoclassical space here, to divide it up and to put bookcases in. So you didn't have this one monotonous long room. You had colors and images that broke it up. And the next slide you can see, depending on the light, it's not quite as dark as it looked in that first photograph. Even though these have faded over the years, it still gives you a sense of the lightness of the color. And two of those roundels up there are of the first Duke and Duchess of Northumberland who commissioned this work. To show you once again how Adam is channeling not just ancient Romans, but more particularly Renaissance artists, this is a um, lovely close up in the ceiling of a hand painted panel. And if you look in this next slide at the ceiling of the Villa Madama in Rome, designed by Raphael, though this is much more abusive and over the top, you can very much see what Adam is using in his much more subdued English way here. This whole gallery ends with a cute little turret room at the end, a very small little round room that can hold maybe three or four people. You may have had tea in here. It has incredible plasterwork, has a little dome ceiling as you can see, and it has this bird cage, and that's a mechanical bird in there that you could wind up and he would tweet and move. There's a, a clock underneath the cage. I'm also pointing out to you in the plasterwork where those two black arrows are, griffins again, showing you something that, that Adam made de rigueur for anything to do with neoclassical design. A much less neoclassical room, but still a classical room, is the red drawing room which is, I think, spectacular for its carpet. It has its original red silk spittle fields on the wall. Look how the carpet has been rolled up. This is a house that gets a lot of visitors. You can see that little rope there on the left. That's for people to walk by without having to actually step on the carpet, but to get a view of this amazing carpet. Because these colors, just think what they were like when they were new, because they're still brilliant and vivid now. When they were new, 200, 30 years ago, they were just knocking your socks off. But the real reason you come into this room to knock your socks off is because of the ceiling. This ceiling is the most expensive that Adam ever designed and probably only a dupe could afford to have it done. The reason it was so expensive is because everything was painted by hand. And you'll see in this next slide in the close up why that was so expensive. Because unlike a plaster ceiling, where you can turn out things repeatedly from a mold, every little thing you see there was hand painted. There is plaster work in there, but all the images, even the little leaves were painted by hand minutely on a ceiling. Um, an astonishing work of art and very few of these images repeat themselves. Let's talk about something practical that, that Robert Adam has given us today. And that is the Richmond Race Cup, which you see here designed in 1764. This one is in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. There are a few of these still running around. This was given to the winner of a horse race. And it's important because Adam took the design for this from ancient Roman funerary designs and ancient Roman vases. Why that's important particularly is because every loving cup, every trophy, everything we think of today that looks like this is actually a descendant of this because Adam took this design and he made it something that was used to give winners of anything you can think of. The Adam design itself permeated the United States where we called it and still do call it federal architecture. And a lovely example of that is a house called Boscobel in New York that you see here. 
built in 1804 to 1808. This is a classic example, swags coming down from that second floor porch, the balustrade going round around the roof. Um, Adam at his very best, very much in an American idiom, this would be much too small for Adam to work on, but for America, this is a very grand house indeed. And then we can take it here, home, to Beacon Hill in Boston, where you can see um, all over Beacon Hill, these fan lights. This is another Adam innovation that um, we consider federal architecture, but very much something that would not exist without Adam. And even to the White House itself, in 1904, Teddy Roosevelt hired the most famous architectural firm of all time in America, McKim, Mead and White, to redo some of the rooms, including the entrance hall. And the entrance hall, you, as you see it here in 1904, is completely derivative from Adam. This is exactly the kind of entrance hall he would design for a great British country house. So we have the White House, which is in of itself modeled on an English country house, even from the outside, living with us right today in Washington. And to bring everything full circle, um, there's an amazing house in California that was done in 2004. This library was designed specifically in the Adams style. This was um, a client who really wanted authenticity. So specialists from Britain were brought over and stayed weeks here to cast and to manufacture in the 18th century fashion all the plaster work and Adam colors were used. You'll see in this next slide, um, this little niche where you could take books from the library and read in a little sitting room that's right off the library, which I think is just spectacular. Look at that Adam ceiling, look at the frieze with wonderful blue and white, very Wedgwoody-esque. There are so many things in Adam that influence our lives today that I think most of us are not even aware of. Robert Adam has been hugely written about. The most recent book by my colleague, Jeremy Musson, which you see the cover of here, is I think one of the best Robert Adam, Country House Design, Decoration, and the Art of Elegance. This book um, came out in 2017, and you see here in the cover a house that I did not talk about. This is Kinwood House in London, and this is the library that Adam designed there. But all of this together gives you, I think, a sense of what Adam brought to this world. All of these houses that I've talked about um, are on my website and in an act of shameless self-promotion. You can see the URL for my website down here. You can find much more about the history of these houses on the website than I was able to tell you today, together with almost all the photographs that I've shown you and more. So thank you so very much for joining me this afternoon for, I hope, a journey to a neoclassical wonderland. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, so before we get to your questions, I'm happy to announce that since this webinar series has been so popular that we are continuing it, um, that we will have uh, two other, we've scheduled two other programs, one in August and one in September. You can learn more about these programs, uh, register for them, learn more about uh, the other programs that we do through American Ancestors all online. Um, that, And you can find all of that on AmericanAncestors.org slash education slash online hyphen classes. All right, so let's get to your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask Kurt, go ahead and type it into the questions panel and we'll get to as many as we can uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, so Kurt, William asks, um, so in addition to the decorative aspects of their architecture and their interiors, were there any functional breakthroughs that they made either in ventilation, lighting, heating, that sort of thing? That's a really good question, and the, the short answer is I don't know, but I would have to guess the answer is no. Um, I'm sure there's some minor innovations made. One of the things I didn't mention is that Soho House, which Adam did not design in, in Birmingham, where um, Matthew Bolton lived, that was built in the late 18th century. It was the first house in Britain to have central heating since the Romans occupied Britain. So you could say that Adam was probably incorporating ideas like that from people he was working with, but I don't know of anything that he innovated particularly other than the designs themselves. And Bagley asks, what were the fortunes of the men who had these houses built? What were they, where did those fortunes come from? What were they based on? Well, now that's a loaded question. Um, so the, of the houses I've shown you today, my favorite is Harwood House in Yorkshire. And that's a perfect example because that, was built on slaves. 
they owned slaves in the Indies. They had, I believe, over 3,000 slaves working on plantations. And I think you'll see a lot of these houses had money coming from slaves. But some of them, the Northumberlands, for instance, at Zion House, um, came through land, and particularly land that was acquired after the dissolution of the monasteries in the 1530s and 1540s, when Henry VIII brought England round to the Protestant religion. And he gave big tracts of land to his friends or sold them at discount prices, and these became the basis of fortunes. And of course, that was the nature of a country house. Um, certainly before the 18th century, it was all based on land. And the most important thing you could do to be able to afford a house like this is to marry a rich heiress. Um, so many other fortunes came from something as simple as wool. Wool was something that Britain was and still is actually uniquely qualified to bring to the world because for some reason that no one quite understands, the sheep in Britain produce a wool that's different from anywhere else. And the Italians who weave the best fabrics always want British wool. As a matter of fact, actually in the 18th century, some Italians captured some British sheep and brought them back to Italy because you know why would you pay the Brits when you could grow your own in Italy? But it didn't work because it's obviously the atmosphere, probably the cold and the rain that makes these things so valuable. So a lot of early fortunes were also based on sheep. Thank you. Uh, Bronwyn asks, where did Robert Adam live during these years when he was designing uh, the buildings around the country, these beautiful homes? Where, where did he himself live? He lived in London, um, and most of his family did. He had sisters as well, he and his brothers who worked in the office. They ran a very big firm. They um, made a fortune and lost a fortune. They did speculative developments. Um, they did something called the Adelphi Terrace in London, which sadly doesn't exist anymore. Um, although there were remnants of it left, that was this huge housing development that pretty much put them almost into bankruptcy. But they, once they could, once they could escape Scotland, they went down to London and they never left. And uh, let's see, Anne asks, so at Kettleston, you showed us that beautiful room with all the blue, uh, the w blue wall coverings, the sofas. Yes, yes. Um, did Robert Adam, uh, did he, design that blue wall covering as well as the upholstery on the sofa? Um, I don't know if he designed the wall covering. I know he specified the color. Um, I know he designed the design for the fabric on the, on the sofas. He would very much want these things to play off and complement each other. So it's hard to know exactly where his hands come in. What's unusual about Adam is because he was so popular and so successful in his own lifetime, much of what he did was documented. So we have a lot of evidence that's left. Very sadly, actually, when his widow died, and this would be, I think, in the early 19th century, um, all of his drawings were auctioned and nobody wanted them because he had fallen so far out of favor. His style had moved on. And there was one man, Sir John Soane, who bought the whole lot. So the most important collection of anything to do with Adam at Sir John Soane's Museum in London, where they have a whole archive of his drawings, not just by him, but from people who worked in his office for almost all the buildings that he did. And you'll find lots of marginalia talking about where ideas came from and how things should be designed. And let's see, so many great questions. Um, now, Heather asks, how did the saloons get their name? Of course, we usually here in America think of a <laughs> saloon as something very different. Uh, so how did that kind of room name get its name? Heather, I wish I could answer that question because I've wondered that myself. When I first started studying these things decades ago, I would always correct it to salon. So I thought, well, this has to be a typo because of the reasons that Ginevra just said. It sounds like something that Bugs Bunny would go into in the Wild West. Um, I don't know. I simply don't know. I'm sure it's probably fairly easy to find out, but I am unable to give you that answer, I'm sorry to say. And Linda asks, uh, did he do any of the, did Robert Adam do any of the homes around Aberdeen? Um, I don't know of any homes near Aberdeen that he did. It doesn't say he didn't do them. As he got more successful, of course, he only wanted really rich clients. And the problem was um, compared to England, Scotland was very poor. And there were not many potential clients there. What you could do if you want to find out, which I'm not obviously able to tell you off the top of my head, is go to my, my website, thedcamello.com, and you can use a search and you can type in Robert Adam 
and then I would click on Aberdeen sure so get the whole county and you'll come up with whatever Adam did in that county. Now we have a few questions uh, regarding um, Palladio and Influ their influence. Uh, so, a few questions. Uh, what influence did Palladio have on the English neoclassical style? Oh my God, huge, 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 huge. Um, so, Palladianism in England preceded neoclassicism. So, Palladianism um, was basically introduced in the large scale to Britain by Lord Burlington in the early 18th century. And Neoclassicism is, I would say, an offshoot of Platonism. So Palladio, is he, he, Palladio to me is the most important architect who ever lived. And so everything was based on some way or another on Palladio. And as wonderful as Adam was and as innovative as he was, he was channeling other people's works, putting his own stamp on it to be sure. But I don't know if I'd call him a huge originator where Palladio was. And also a few questions regarding the architect who designed the Adam style library in the California home that we showed. Do you know who that <laughs> architect is? Um, I don't, but if somebody wants to email me at heritage tours at nehgs.org, I can find out pretty easily for you who did that. Um, the house has sadly since been sold, so I don't know what the condition of that room is now, um, but it's, um, I, I, can, I can find out for you. All right, maybe just one final question before we say goodbye for the day. Uh, Meredith asks, who do you see as the successor to Adam? Is anyone of his caliber? <laughs> I'm laughing because there is actually an architect alive today whose name is Robert Adam, who's English, and who practices in this style. And that is his given name the name he was born with, so he's not trying to picky tail on that. So certainly Robert Adam, there are a number of architects today who practice in this style. The most famous, um, the one who's gotten the most attention, and his name is escaping me at the moment, he's still alive, I think he's quite old now. His son has taken over the practice. Oh, damn it, I can't think of his name. Um, once again, <laughs> email me, I can tell you his name. Um, there, there are a number of classical architects around the world, and certainly in Britain. In America, there's only one architecture school in the United States that still teaches classical architecture. Because don't forget, by the middle of the 20th century, classicism was considered just, oh, so yesterday, just nobody taught it. And that prejudice against classical architecture is still very much with us today, which is why Notre Dame is the only architecture school in the country that requires architects who graduate from the program to be able to design with a pencil and not with a computer to draw things on their own and and they teaches them classical elements because the idea of traditional classical architecture is everything built on elements and everything is based on symmetry and this is something that I think you're finding now I'm old I'm almost 60 I when I was growing up nobody was designing classical architecture and I never thought I would see it in my lifetime and it's coming back there's a wonderful organization um, in New York, the Institute of Classical Art and Architecture that does nothing but support this kind of research and give scholarships to architects to not only study in the style in America, but also to go and study, particularly in Italy and throughout Europe. Um, and there, there's just, there's so much going on right now. So I would say there are a lot of architects that are, um, I think, worthy of the mantle of Robert Adams' reputation today and are carrying forward his designs. Quinlan Terry, that's his name, sorry, I just thought of the name. So the architect I'm trying to think of who is the most famous today, the Brit, his name is Quinlan, Q-U-I-N-L-A-N, last name Terry, T-E-R-R-Y. He's done a lot of important buildings, particularly at um, Cambridge University. Thank you. And a few people also wrote in regarding saloon. So it is a variation of the French salon. And uh, Roger says, according to the internet, saloon is an 18th century variation <laughs> of the French salon. Uh, the same basic uh, meaning, a large hall or space. So thank you, Roger. Thank you, everyone, for writing thank in. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's lovely to know. Thank you. And unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. If you do have other questions, please feel free to contact us at heritagetours at nehgs.org. 
Uh, but thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a sur survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you and for others. If you'd like to learn more about American Ancestors and the fabulous heritage tours, many of which are led by Kurt, please visit us at AmericanAncestors.org slash heritage hyphen tours. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.